Last week we began a new series on the book of Leviticus and we placed the book in its canonical context within the Pentateuch or the books of the law, uh, the Torah. And uh, what we saw was that Leviticus and all that it contains, the, the offerings or sacrifices, the priesthood, the laws around ritual purity, the day of atonement, the laws of moral exhortation to living a holy life, all of these things were actually given to God's people as an expression of God's mercy and grace to enable his people to dwell in his presence. That is what this book is seeking to set out. Everything in this book is to enable us to be in his presence, God's people. Because this is life. To have God is to have life. To be in the presence of God is to be in, in the presence of the author of life. And that is what we all ultimately long for, even if we are unaware so the Lord begins in this book by speaking to Moses from the tabernacle. Uh, remember, the Hebrew title of this book is after the first Hebrew word, just means, and he called. And 85% of this book is direct divine speech to the people of God from the tabernacle. And he, he um, reveals how he is to be worshipped properly as the divine king in their midst, now resident among them. Chapters 1 through 7 reveal to us the instructions to the priests and the laity of the people of Israel uh, about the five types of offerings that will characterize the worship of this one God and that will enable them to dwell safely in his presence. We need to acknowledge as we open up this book that this is foreign territory for basically all of us. The worship of Israel as divinely revealed was marked by the sacrifice and slaughter of animals. Imagine the sights and sounds and smells and messes and mistakes that would characterize this kind of daily engagement with God. And all of this in a tremendous cost to the people of God in what they had to bring to God in worship. Um, some of you maybe have been butchers or are butchers. Maybe you've been a farmer. Maybe some of you are hunters. If so, you have a much better idea of what we're talking about here than the rest of us. The closest I could get was growing up in Colorado. Occasionally we went to Greeley, Colorado. And Greeley is the home of all kinds of slaughterhouses. And the moment you get out of the car, you smell it. <laughs> it's just the scent in the air. That's the kind of thing the people of Israel would have been around all the time because of this kind of worship that God had revealed to them. And in all of this worship, the people are actually very involved. There was no such thing as a, a passive worshiper in Israel. They weren't just bystanders or consumers of what the, the priestly caste was doing by any means. A worshiper would bring an animal from his flock to the gates of the tabernacle and there would lean his hand on the animal and then slit the animal's throat and collect the blood coming out of the animal and then dismember the animal so that certain parts of it could be burned up on the offering of burnt, uh, the burnt offering altar and so on and so forth. Gordon Wenham uh, writes this about this experience. He says, using a little imagination, every reader of the Old Testament soon realizes that these ancient sacrifices were very moving occasions. They make modern church services seem tame and dull by comparison. The ancient worshiper, worshiper did not just listen to the minister and sing a few hymns. He was actively involved in worship, choosing the animal, bringing it to the sanctuary, killing it, then watching it go up in smoke before his eyes. And this very participatory worship that is foreign to us had a kind of logic to it. Morales, one of, an Old Testament scholar I quoted last week, points out that, quote, worship through sacrifice was a journey into the presence of God. And what he means is that these offerings clarify or follow a pathway into the presence of God, which is the goal of this kind of worship. The pathway begins with expiation or atonement and forgiveness, dealing with the sin that separates us from God. These are sacrifices for or to restore communion. And it continues with consecration. The idea that we are wholly or completely given over to God as his people. And these are sacrifices in communion. And then it moves to communion or fellowship. Which is the goal of all of this worship. The sharing of a fellowship meal in the peace or fellowship offering of chapter 3. That is the end goal. That was the one offering of these five. That the worshipers ate together the meat from that offering. In the presence of the Lord. A fellowship covenant meal with their God. Feasting in his presence. 
So there's this pathway or trajectory. And over the next few weeks, as we look at these sacrificial rites, we're going to follow that pathway, beginning today with sacrifices that restore communion. Next week, then, sacrifices in communion. And then the final week on these three weeks, sacrifices um, of communion, of celebration of communion. So today, we'll begin with the the gift of sacrifices um, that are to restore communion, to deal with sin. And these actually are given to us in chapters 4, 5, and the beginning of chapter 6 of Leviticus, which you can find on page 82 of the Bible that you have in front of you. And so we'll look at the gift of these sacrifices in four parts. The gift, the mechanism, the nature, and the scope. The gift, the mechanism, the nature, and the scope as we tackle this material. All of this, of course, is to see the depth, or with greater depth, the richness and wonder and awe of God's gift to us in his son, Jesus. That's always the answer to anything in Leviticus. It's all pointing to him. And so I hope we'll see that as we look more closely at these. So first, the gift, a way to deal with sin. Sin is, I mentioned this last week, it is a big deal. It is our deepest problem. J.N.D. Anderson was a, an Islamic scholar, a Christian scholar of Islam in the 20th century in England. And he wrote this in one of his books, sin is in fact a universal sickness and man's deepest need is to understand this and to find the cure. This universal sickness has an awful impact or effect and that is that it separates us from fellowship or communion with the God who created us, which is the one thing that we long for and need. In her book on the crucifixion, Fleming Rutledge writes this. She says, to be in sin, biblically speaking, means being catastrophically separated from the eternal love of God. It means to be on the other side of an impassable barrier of exclusion from God's heavenly banquet. Sin entraps us, puts us in a a, a place that we can't get to the one place that we need to be. And the question is, how can we get across How can we deal with this issue so that we can actually be in communion with the living God? I've shared this before, but it's worth repeating. Uh, A young Jain student in India, Jainism is a a minority religion in India, uh, wrote to the Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones in the early 20th century a note. And I should say that a key principle of Jainism is um, true perception, true and right knowledge, true and right conduct is the key to liberation. And this is what that young, sincere Jane student wrote, I have deep faith in my own religion. I believe it to be entirely true, but I need not be ashamed to tell that it exacts unflinching duty and knows no grace. Philosophically, it is all right. You may believe according to it that the power behind all things is supremely just and indifferent, but we err. We know not why. We are led on, as it were, on the waves of sin and mistakes. There are powers too great for our frail being. And I wish then that there were a God who would be kind to me, who would feel my weaknesses, and who would extricate me from the meshes of sin and temptation. Such a powerful statement about the human condition. And the longing, did you catch the longing of this? I wish that there were a God who would be kind to me. You know, the amazing gift that we have as Christians who believe in the biblical word is that we get to proclaim that there is such a God. He is the the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has, in fact, been kind to his people. He has made a way out of that entrapment in sin and the alienation that it produces and the isolation and offered us a way into life. If there's a banner verse, not from our text, but from the Bible for today, it would be Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, which says this, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who, O Lord, could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. God, if you'd mark iniquities, if you kept an account of these things, who could be in your presence? Who could stand before you? But with you there is forgiveness. That you may be feared, that we may continue in covenant relationship with you and have the life that we long for from you. 
How awesome it is that the scriptures proclaim a God whose very nature is to forgive, to be compassionate, and to be merciful. And he reveals this about his nature at the most awkward moment in a way. We looked at the golden calf incident briefly last week. But in Exodus 32, while the covenant is being ratified, God's people build a golden calf. They reject God's oversight over them for this golden calf, this idol, using Aaron to do that. And while that's going on, Moses then has this interaction with God. And God lets his glory pass by. And then he says these words that become determinative for the understanding of God throughout the whole of the Old Testament and really the whole of the Bible. He says this to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. But the thousandth generation of forgiveness and steadfast love and faithfulness. Visiting iniquity just for the third or fourth generation. Do you see the balance God is saying in my character? It is to be a God of compassion and mercy who forgives sinful people. Because why? Because of what we said last week. God's desire, and this is amazing. God's desire is to dwell with us. It's to be with us. And so God is committed because of his deep desire to be with his people to provide a a way for forgiveness. And that gift, of course, is Jesus. And we'll get to that. And I hope lace that through this message. But in the book of Leviticus, that gift is given to God's people as as God speaks to Moses from the tabernacle in two sacrifices, two sacrificial rites that deal specifically with sin. The sin or purification offering in chapters 4 up to 513 And the guilt or reparation offering from chapter 5, verse 14 to chapter 6, verse 7. How do we know that these are given to deal with sin? Well, just two quick points from the text. The first is they're commanded of the people of God in response to sin. So listen to verse 2 of chapter 4. And if you have it open, that's on page 82. You can follow along. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, or does any one of them, And then he gives them the instructions to offer this sin or purification offering. We'll come back, by the way, later to the word unintentionally, which I'm sure that caught many your your attention. Chapter 5, verse 14, as it begins, the reparation or guilt offering. If anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, and then he gives them the instructions to bring a ram as a guilt or reparation offering. So these sacrificial rites are given in response to an act of sin. Unintentional, but nonetheless, an act of sin. Second, that's why they're given. Let's let's look at what they produce. The results of these offerings is atonement and divine forgiveness. That's how God deals with sin. So the refrain about the purification or sin offering, which we find seven times in chapters four and five, is this. You could look at verse 26 for an example. And the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. Three times in the reparation or guilt offering, we get this refrain. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. Atonement and forgiveness through these sacrificial rites was the gift of God to his people that they might deal with sin. Let me take care of one one matter that just needs to be addressed. You've noticed I've been using a couple of different names. So let me address the names for these two rites. The Hebrew word used for The sin offering, traditionally so-called sin offering, can be translated as sin, but it is built on the same root as a verb in Hebrew that means to cleanse, expurgate, and decontaminate. And given that this offering is used not just to deal with the defilement of sin, but also to deal with the defilement of impurity, it may be helpful to follow many modern scholars to refer to this as the purification offering to focus on its cleansing nature and effect. Again, both sin and impurity in Leviticus can defile and both require cleansing. And this is the offering that's used in both cases. And so because impurity is not a moral issue, it's not about sin or not sin, it can be a little confusing to call it the sin offering and then say that it applies to situations of purity or ritual purity or ritual impurity. 
So I think it is helpful actually to follow many more modern and many evangelical scholars in calling this the, purif the purification offering because it can, be dealt with, uh, it can deal with both kinds of impurity or of defilement. So that's what I'm going to refer to it now going on. So I don't have to keep saying two words. I'm going to call it the purification offering just to make this text even harder because you're going to look at the Bible and see sin offering and I'm going to say purification offering. The second and further, the traditionally named guilt or trespass, as it was in the King James Version offering, um, is better referred to as the reparation offering, given that the underlying Hebrew word can in fact mean guilt, and that's where we get the name, but it can also mean reparation for guilt. And that's clearly what that offering is doing here in Leviticus. It's about making amends for wrongdoing. So I'm going to call that the reparation offering. So the purification offering and the reparation offering, these are the gifts God gives to his people to deal with sin. That's part one. Part two now, the mechanism of these gifts. The mechanism for the atonement that leads to divine forgiveness is the blood of the sacrificial animal in these rites, which is a substitute for the worshiper. And I should say, chapter four gives us five instances of the purification offering. First for the high priest, then for the whole congregation sinning, then for a leader in Israel, then for the common people twice. Chapter 5 deals with some sins of omission and the pur purification offering for them. And then at the end of chapter 5 and chapter 6, we get the reparation offering dealing first with unintentional sins and then with deliberate but minor sins. So that's the way the content of our text is working. In each of these rites, there is a moment where the worshiper selects, that's what we call the presentation rite of the sacrifice. They select an animal from their flock without blemish. And they bring that to the entrance of the tabernacle. And then there's the, what we call the hand leaning rite, where the, the hand of the worshiper is leaned onto the head with some pressure onto the head of the animal. And then there's the slaughtering rite, where the animal is slaughtered by the, by the worshiper, meaning probably the throat was slit so they could collect the blood. In that, that act of hand leaning upon the animal, what that part of the act most likely suggests, and we don't get in Leviticus, it doesn't say this means this, so we do our best with understanding things, most likely suggests an identification of the worshiper with the animal that is going to the sacrifice so that the animal can be a substitute for the worshiper. Now atonement, which is the refrain here, to make the priest will make atonement. Atonement includes two dimensions. It includes cleansing and a ransom payment or ransom. And both are present whenever atonement is mentioned. But often one dimension is foregrounded more than the other. And that's what we see in these two offerings. In the purification offering, the cleansing dimension of atonement is foregrounded. Sin defiles us. We know this when we sin or do something wrong, we can say that we feel dirty. David in Psalm 51, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, gives voice to that reality. But more than defiling us, sin, and this is foreign to us as we go back to the world of Leviticus, sin can actually defile the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. One Old Testament scholar describes that when the people of God sin, it creates this kind of unholy dust that then settles on the tent of meeting and all the vessels that are contained within it. And that defilement, because of that sin, which is infecting the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, must be dealt with. It must be cleansed to ensure that the holy God's presence can continue to dwell in that tent among his people. And so the purification offering has a dual cleansing dimension to it, where it cleanses both the vessels and the tent of the tabernacle, and it cleanses the heart of the worshiper. And the agent or the mechanism of that cleansing is the blood of the sacrificial animal. So we read in the purification offering, the, the way in which this works is the priest will take some of that blood that's collected He'll dip his finger in it. And then for the high priest's sins and for the sins of the whole congregation, he'll go into the holy place in the tent and sprinkle the blood seven times with his finger in front of the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies. And then he'll put some of the blood on the four horns of the altar of incense inside the tabernacle. In situations where it's a leader of Israel or a commoner from Israel that sins, the priest won't go into the tabernacle, but will do it on the bronze altar outside the tabernacle, the burnt offering altar, where the four horns will be, will be covered in the blood of the sacrificial animal, and then the rest of the blood will be poured out on the base of the altar. The blood in this case is the cleansing agent that's wiping away the defilement, the infection 
in the tabernacle that's due to the sin of the worshiper. And at the same time, it is cleansing the worshiper as well. I should say, you'll note that there was a distinction there. Uh, that the one in the, in the case of the high priest and the congregation goes all the way into the tabernacle. Which is to say that, <clears throat> that these high profile sins of the high priest who represents the whole congregation or of the whole congregation itself must be dealt with in a more dramatic way because their, their defilement penetrates more deeply to where God resides because it's the whole of the community. And the high priest represents the whole of the community. Whereas for the commoner, it stays outside. And even just for a leader in Israel, it stays outside. The cleansing only needs to take place in the courtyard. This suggests that the sins of a leader are more costly. All sinners are equal, but despite the common phrase, all sins are actually not equal, according to Leviticus 4. There's a distinguishing here in the effects of the sins of leaders. And honestly, we, we know that, don't we? We watch that play out when Christian leaders fall, that there is a wake. And maybe some of you have been so deeply impacted by that in a church, perhaps in the past, of where leaders have fallen into sin. There's just a tremendous impact and effect of that sin upon the community of God's people. These sins, too, require a more costly sacrifice. Uh, they require a bull, both for the high priest and for the congregation, whereas it's just a male goat or a female goat or a female sheep for the congregant or the leader of Israel. Okay, so that's the purification offering. Still on the mechanism, the next idea is ransom or a ransom payment, and that's highlighted in the reparation offering. In his soon-to-be-published commentary on Leviticus, Old Testament scholar Jay Sklar observes, quote, that covenant disloyalty to a king was a serious offense in the ancient Near East, but offenders could atone by admitting their wrong and paying a penalty. That is, the king would accept a lesser payment, a ransom, which would atone for the wrongdoing, repair the damage between the servant and the king, and restore the relationship. And that's the same model for the God of Israel, is that he says, look, I'll accept a ransom payment, for the wrongdoing that was done, a lesser payment than what should be given, which is the life of the sinner should be given. I'll accept something less than that and call it adequate for, for addressing or atoning for the wrong so that the wrong might be dealt with and the relationship, which is God's deep heart, might be restored. That's the idea of a ransom payment. And so God allows as a ransom payment for the sin of the worshiper, the lifeblood of the animal that has been sacrificed in the offering. We read about this in Leviticus 17 as we read, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Ransom and purification through the blood of the sacrificial animal. The priest makes atonement for the worshiper, and then we read in the refrain in our text that the worshiper shall be forgiven. The verb to forgive is always in the passive implying that it's not the priest who forgives the worshiper, it's divine forgiveness. It's the, the forgiveness coming from God who forgives this worshiper in response to the sacrificial rite being completed, to the blood being poured out or offered up. And then the relationship is restored. So the mechanism is the blood of the sacrificial animal. Third, the nature of this gift of divine forgiveness and atonement. I want to make four observations about this. First, it's costly. Do you think you would have had to remind anybody in Israel that forgiveness was costly. I mean, think about it. every day they were seeing animals be slaughtered. They were hearing the noise and no doubt the, the, the squeaks and the groans as this was happening. They were smelling it. They were seeing the smoke from the altar go up into the heavens. They were reminded every day of just how costly it was to bring about divine forgiveness in their lives so that they might be in right relationship with the living God. If Flannery O'Connor uh, wrote this, she said, the reader of today is indeed looking for redemption and rightly so, but what he has forgotten is the cost of it. His sense of evil is diluted or lacking altogether. So he has forgotten the price of restoration. One thing as we come back to this text, we should think, wow, divine forgiveness is in fact costly in a very significant way. Second though, though costly, the Lord ensures that, this act, that access to divine forgiveness would be had by all the people. A sign of his mercy is that this path to forgiveness is made accessible. It is very costly, but God made provisions. And we see this in chapter 5, actually. God made provisions for the poor to be able to partake in this offering. I mean, a female goat or a female sheep, the most common flock animals, was still an awful lot. 
And many of the poor didn't have access to that. And so God says, you can bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, which likely most of the poor could go out and catch somewhere, so they could bring to the tabernacle for their sin offering, for their purification offering. And God goes even further for the very poor and says, look, you, if you can't even do that, you can bring a tenth of an ephah of flour. He says, look, you're going to have access, access to divine forgiveness. Wherever you are on the socioeconomic spectrum, you will have access. So he makes it accessible to all. The third thing to say about the nature of this gift is that it requires confession and repentance. Now, all of these sacrificial rites give us sometimes different details. And there's a detail in verse 5 of chapter 5 that I want you to see. It says this, when he realizes his guilt in any of these these acts of unintentional sin, and confesses the sin that he has committed. Well, that's the only place that confession is mentioned in our text and all of these rites, but we should conclude by that that confession was a part, it was a requirement of this receiving of divine forgiveness, which means this, that the outward acts of the ritual are not adequate or sufficient. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient to receive divine forgiveness. It was it was important that the heart reflected what the sacrificial act was reflecting externally. And here in verse 5 of chapter 5, we read that when you come to know your sin, you will confess it. That means a public confession of your wrongdoing as a sign of your repentant heart. What does David say? That the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. God can see the heart. And many times in scripture we read that God is not pleased with burnt offerings and sacrifices when the heart of Israel is wicked and hardened. To gleefully gloat in one's sin or wrongdoing and yet to bring the right sacrifice anyway wouldn't produce the effect that the right was meant to create. It had to be accompanied by confession and repentance. And then fourthly under the nature is that divine forgiveness, particularly in sins that are a violation of a neighbor's property or something of one's neighbor, and that's chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, divine forgiveness is contingent upon making amends. This one jolts us a little bit, but it's clear in Leviticus chapter 6 that divine forgiveness is given to the worshiper at the end of completing the rite. Well, what happens right before the worshiper is to bring the ram as a reparation offering? It says, anything about which he has sworn falsely, verse 5, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. Which is to say this, if you've defrauded your neighbor of $100, if you stole $100 from your neighbor, and then you come under the conviction of God and you're ready to come clean, that you should first, before you go to the tabernacle to make sacrifice, you need to go to that neighbor and pay back the $100 and then give them an extra $20 to count as reparation. And if this just seems like an archaic Old Testament concept, what does Zacchaeus do when Jesus comes to have a meal at his house? He says, if I've defrauded anyone, I restore him, do you remember? Fourfold, 400%. John the Baptist, when the Pharisees are coming out to him at the River Jordan, he rebukes them and says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So divine forgiveness in a situation where we have wronged our brother or sister, our neighbor, is contingent upon making reparation with that neighbor in in the way that we can. And we can be creative in thinking these sins in chapter 6 deal with financial matters which it's a little easier to calculate 20 percent but what about when we lie or when we gossip or when we hurt our brother or sister what does it mean at least in this concept to think creatively about making amends as a sign of our repentance and then coming and offering our gift to the lord on the altar first go be reconciled with your brother matthew 5 and then come and offer your gift so that's the fourth thing about the nature of this gift finally the scope what sins are forgiven through these sacrificial rites the old testament knows a three-part classification for sins there are unintentional sins there are deliberate sins but which are minor and then there are high-handed sins which we read about in numbers chapter 15 these are serious acts of rebellion against the covenant king that are a rejection of his authority and lordship that are met with the penalty of being cut off which could either mean death or exile And these sacrificial rites, the purification and reparation offerings, only apply to the unintentional sins or to the deliberate but minor sins. They do not apply to high-handed sins, to that third category. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Unintentional sins. 
You heard this in our readings. If anyone sins unintentionally, that's just a refrain throughout these texts. Well, what do we mean by unintentional? Basically, we mean sins that are not intended by the worshiper. Accidental sins. You might say, well, what's that? Well, let me give you an example from my life. I was just to turn 16 and I got my driver's license and I just left the velodrome in Colorado Springs and I was driving down the street at night and a cop pulled me over and I could, I didn't think I was speeding and he came up to my window and he's like, your lights are off. Well, I didn't intend for my lights to be off. I certainly didn't like, plan to to have a violation of the law in that way but the officer did not just give me a warning he gave me a ticket because ignorance is not the same thing as innocence and here's what I want you to recognize that the thrust of Leviticus 4 5 and the beginning of 6 is actually about unintentional sins I mean just think about this for a moment this is how holy God is when we think of sin we immediately think of conscious acts of rebellion that we commit as individuals God says I'm going to give you this elaborate sacrificial rite purification offering for cleansing a reparation offering for ransom the blood of the sacrificial animal to deal with your unintentional sins holy 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 is the Lord God almighty that he would want the people of God to be cleansed from that which they had committed unintentionally Now, it goes beyond that, but I just think that's an amazing thing to reflect on out of this text. The second thing is sins of omission, and we read about these at the beginning of chapter 5. This is a a witness who knows something about a situation, and when there's a call to testify, he or she doesn't go and bear witness, and therefore perverts the cause of justice. That's a sin of omission. Or touching an unclean animal or an unclean human being, and then not dealing with that, forgetting it, and not dealing rightly with your impurity. Or then lastly, it's about uh, giving a rash oath and then forgetting that you actually made the oath and then not fulfilling the oath, which is also a sin of omission. And the the, uh, purification sacrifice in chapter 5 deals with those sins of omission. And then in chapter 6, it's actually these deliberate but minor sins. We've looked at defrauding and stealing from your neighbor, making a false oath, which is a breach against the Lord as well as against your neighbor. Sinning against our neighbor is never just a sin against our neighbor. It's also a sin against the Lord. And for these deliberate but minor sins, the reparation offering is sufficient to bring about or to secure divine forgiveness. What's the scope of these offerings? Well, then you might say, well, what about these high-handed sins? And it is true that the sacrificial rites do not address high-handed sins and yet yet we do see atonement and forgiveness offered by God in a wonderful article in the bulletin of biblical research from 2012 Old Testament scholar Jay Sklar actually writes about examines the seven examples of high-handed sins in the narrative from Exodus to numbers which includes Leviticus the first one of course is the golden calf incident in Exodus 32 and he studies these seven examples and shows that the Lord's total rejection of the people is quote avoided because of the actions of a mediator on Israel's behalf a mediator who affects atonement so that the Lord's relationship with his people can continue five times that mediator in those seven is Moses One time it's Aaron, the high priest. And the seventh time in Numbers 25, it's Phineas, this mediator. And on behalf of the mediator and the mediator's intercession, Israel receives atonement and forgiveness for their high-handed rebellion against the Lord. For another example, we might think of David and his high-handed sins of adultery and murder. And yet God forgives him. that's what psalm 51 is all about so though the sacrificial rites don't deal with these high-handed sins thanks be to god as he revealed to moses in exodus 34 that his character is such that he is eager to forgive and to show mercy on sinners like us so to close because god longs to dwell with his people he is a god who forgives our sins and makes a way for this to happen His provision, of course, of these two sacrificial rites in Leviticus 4, 5, and 6 is merely a pointer to what would be his provision all along. These acts were given, these rites were given to point to something beyond them, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus 
and his life, death, and resurrection are the gift that God has given to his world. That the purification and reparation offerings were only pointing to. Remember what John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or Hebrews 1 verse 3 we read about Jesus that he made purification for sins. Or 1 John 1 verse 7 we read that the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the purification or sin offering. And Paul refers to him as such in Romans 8 chapter 3 by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for a sin offering he condemned sin in the flesh. And as the purification offering, we didn't consider this detail, but was burned outside the camp. Look at Leviticus 4, 12 or 21. So too, as we read in Hebrews 13, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Jesus is the purification offering. Jesus is the reparation offering, the true ransom as well. Remember he said, the son of man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or Peter in his first epistle writes in this way, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. How much greater is this gift, the gift of Jesus, the Son of God, than the gift of the purification or reparation offerings long ago to God's people? How much wider is this gift and how much more costly? The cost of the gift of the reparation and purification offering was borne by the worshiper. The worshiper had to go to his flock and pick out an animal without blemish, which was so valuable, and bring it to the tabernacle entrance and have it slaughtered by by his own hand. Yet God in his abundant mercy and forgiveness and longing to dwell with his people would then enter into our flesh and take upon himself, the holy Lord of glory would take upon himself the cost of our forgiveness. That through the blood of his son, he might wash away our impurities. Through the blood of his son, he might make adequate payment for our debt so that we might have that which brought was between us and God uh, taken away, the defilement washed away, the payment made, so that we might be reconciled to the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, that we might have fellowship with Him. That is the glory of the gospel. And this book of Leviticus points us to that glory, this indescribable gift that God has given us in the person of His Son. You know, Jesus breathed his last in agony at Calvary as the sacrificial animal, the sacrifice, the, sacrifice, the, the purifying lamb, and shed his blood so that we might never stop breathing in the presence of the God of life. Thanks be to God. A God who takes sin so seriously, but a God whose character is to bring forgiveness will go to such great lengths to give gifts to his people. Long ago, gifts that would point to this true gift, the great gift of his son, that we might be reconciled, atoned, that our sin might be atoned for, and that we might be in fellowship with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this amazing gift of your son. We are so grateful to you. Lord, let it be the source of our joy this week that we have been forgiven through the blood of your son, Jesus, that we have been ransomed through his life. What a glorious thing that so long ago you gave your people these signs that would point to this incredible sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive us for our sin. Grant that we would walk forward in righteousness and holiness that we would be holy as you are holy, as those who have been washed, cleansed, and ransomed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.